Thank you. Welcome. We call to order NID's meeting on April 24th. Will you please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> All right, roll call, please. Here. 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 Right. So we're going to have public comment for items that are not on the agenda. Few more seconds. Anyone on <clears throat> out there on Zoom or something? Public comment. So public comment. Well, we got Judy or Jody. All right, Jody, you're on. Thank you. What did she, did she cross it off? I know she's muted. Okay. Oh, it popped up. All right. How about that? Perfect. Okay. Um, my question is going to be regarding or comment uh, the recreational impact with the Spalding Lake debacle. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering if there's been any uh, word from PG&E regarding the tourism industry basically on Rollins Lake. I myself have three businesses there. Um, this is impacting me beyond measure not to mention the town of Colfax, uh, the grocery stores, the restaurants, the camping equipment, the boating repair places. Has PG&E addressed any of this? If there's any recourse for the tourism industry? We're gonna have this on the workshop. Correct, there is a workshop regarding this item later in the agenda, so we will make sure to touch on that question. Jody, awesome. so we're gonna yeah. go, yeah, we're gonna go through a uh, financial report and then Consent agenda. We're having a workshop, and Cameron is here from PG&E uh, in person to answer questions. And we are going to get into all that, the impacts, and what is being done to uh, to solve the problem. Fantastic. And that will be, yeah. So if you can hang on for a little little while, we'll get to that. Now be, and that's a workshop where people can chime in and ask questions and get responses immediately. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any more public comment for items not on the agenda? All right. Seeing none, uh, public comment is closed. So now we're going to special orders and I'll turn it over to Jennifer and it's investment portfolio review. Chris, do we have? Here? Hello. All right. There he is. All right. Uh, Michael from PFM will review the quarter report for the quarter ending March 31st, 2024 for our investments. Um, and Michael, I will turn it over to you. Excellent. Thanks so much. Glad to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, join. NID and present the uh, investment report for the quarter ending March 31st. Uh, do you hear me okay and or do you see me? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. It looks like I have the ability to do that. Let me know if you can see the presentation on the screens at this point. We can see it. Perfect. Uh, I love when things work the way they're supposed to. Um, I've got a uh, a colleague as well, he may be on, he was uh, planning to join, it's part of uh, Hadi Fritz. He's part of our expanding PFM team in California um, as part of our commitment and growth in the market. I wanted to just uh, call that out and let you know he will be joining. Uh, again, thanks for having me and I appreciate uh, being able to participate in the meeting and present the reports. Um, I guess I'll start with a quick economic update, and that is to say Q1 was quite different from Q4 of 2023. 
Uh, we had a theme in the fourth quarter of 2023 of a soft landing, whether or not we'd have to see a soft landing in the economy or even a hard landing, uh, given where the Fed had um, increased interest rates over their historic rise over the year and a half from zero in 2022 up to five and a quarter to five and a half percent uh, through July of 23. And indeed, uh, we, we haven't seen a landing yet. So we're um, now contemplating no landing in the economy. Uh, the Fed and market participants uh, quickly underestimate, or underestimated the staying power of the consumer strength in the fourth quarter and economic resilience. So where we saw uh, um, you know, an abundance of buying and fixed income in the fourth quarter that pushed rates down and really helped market values, an extraordinary fourth quarter, um, that was not completely, but largely reversed in the first quarter of this year as uh, economic data continued to show strength despite the high rates that the Fed has um, continued to uh, 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 maintain at that five and a quarter and five and a half level with their Fed funds target rate. Uh, so, uh, you know, economic resilience, no landing necessarily. Uh, if we look ahead at inflation, we see... Um, where the Fed paused was kind of at the just just beyond the bottom of this trending line downward. This graph shows CPI, where we hit over nine percent in mid 2022, and that fell um, along with the Fed's restrictive policy over that time. And as soon as they paused, uh, it seems that the inflation rate just kind of trickled along and, and didn't make further progress toward that Fed goal, where we see that green line at two percent. So. Inflation remains above Fed target 2%. Inflation on CPI is measured at 3.5 currently, uh, most recently measured in March year over year. And if we look at the core rate of the CPI, it's actually a little, little bit higher, 3.8%. And core inflation strips out energy and food prices because they tend to be more volatile. So it's a difficult, it adds a little bit of complexity in the measure there. And if you look at kind of on the right-hand side, expectations for inflation in that dotted line, the forecast um, in recent months have actually been lower than where CPI is measured. So CPI is coming in a little bit higher than where the projections have been. Um, you know, inflation is sticky. It's it's difficult. The Fed's trying to manage that. They're trying to bring it down with the where they feel the current rate of policy is restrictive sufficient su sufficiently enough. Um, but it's in that services sector of the um, of inflation that tends to be a little bit more sticky. And it's led largely because of the ec economic growth with strong jobs numbers and wage increases year over year, wage increases exceeding inflation rates. Um, and if we look at you know, recent job numbers, that trend of new jobs has actually been increasing over the last quarter from the prior quarter. So just after the Fed pause, we, we saw an average monthly jobs increase, new jobs of about 212,000 per month. And that in the recent quarter averaged about 276,000 new non-farm payroll jobs per month. So the trend is actually improving. Um, that, that's well above pre-pandemic levels as well. Uh, Rich, you're raising your hand, I see. Yeah, I have a question. Have these been adjusted because the Fed comes back two, three months later and lowers the job numbers. And they seem to be have been doing that for month after month after month. Have these been adjusted to reflect uh, those adjustments? Because a few months were very significant. Yeah, you're right. There were early in the year, there were some adjustments to prior months. That's where we see the October and November numbers below 200,000. Those were initially reported a little higher um, I think December was showing over 300 at some point. That has also been revised. And that tends to be the case as we get, uh, not we, as the as the market gets more um, accurate data, there are, there are revisions to these numbers. So you would see three prior months behind to be final, final reads on those numbers, essentially. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. And also uh, out of the 300 some thousand new jobs, 71,000 were government jobs. Uh, a little over 70,000 health and and industry. Um, but manufacturing went down. So can can you elaborate on how that, what is that forecast going forward? You know, I can't speak to the industry numbers within those at this point. We look at those and 
I have seen them. I don't have that top of mind at the moment, but I can say that with the manufacturing sector, after 17 months of contraction, the manufacturing sector reported actual contract uh, expansion for the first time in this quarter, um, which is a positive sign. Um, I don't know how that relates to the job numbers, but I think it it you know shows can I think it adds to the continued strength story of the economy. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. Um, if I don't see the hand raised and you have a question, please interject and I'll pause for the question. I appreciate the questions. Um, so again, um, you know, I, I think what's telling as well is the strength of the jobs market and the 2.3 million jobs available um, above the number of unemployed actually reported in the marketplace. So, you know, we have more jobs available than there are unemployed workers. And that comes out to about 1.3 jobs available uh, for every unemployed person. And again, that year over year wage growth, well, 4.1% is actually higher than the inflation rate, which is a, a pretty remarkable um, sign of, 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 of uh, with, you know, what's going on with the economy as well. And the same story with GDP, even in December on the, I think it was the December 13th Fed meeting, um, that's kind of where the Fed came out with their projection at that point of what they anticipated to be three rate reductions through 2024. And at that same meeting, they provided um, what's known as the summary of economic projections. And we can see this in a few slides. One of those was GDP, and they anticipated the year would end at 2.6% for that fourth quarter annualized rate of economic growth. When in fact, after a couple of revisions, which I mentioned, economic data sometimes does get revised. But the final read for fourth quarter in 2023 came in at 3.4%. Um, and, and if you look to the right, forecast for the year um, coming in, um, that the Fed summary of it, this gets a little confusing because there's a Fed summary of economic projections that comes out about four times a year. And they've held that now it's at 2.1%, which is higher than where they were in December at 1.4%. Okay. There's also kind of more volatile data coming through formulas um, measured by the GDP now forecast from Atlanta Fed. And it's showing 2.5% um, as of April 4th. Um, but again, you know, just um, strong numbers. Historically, we could kind of thumb, thumb the uh, GDP rate to be around 2%. 2 of course, it does fluctuate. Um, but but um, this does remain, their forecast does remain above their long-term projections of 1.8% of potential growth in the economy. So for three, four, five years out, that 1.8% is what they anticipate. And yet this year, their projections remain higher than that. Um, you know, if we look at last year's market implied probabilities of Fed fund rate reductions for the year, we started the year with expecting five to six rate reductions, a quarter point each through the year. The market quickly reversed itself in that first three months of the year, um, giving back those and now is pricing in only one or two rate reductions, not to start until July or September, where we started the year thinking maybe th those cuts would start in March. That's pushed back now to July or September and only one or two uh, rate, rate reductions for the year. Um, it's the inflation data that seems to be the predominant theme here until that comes down, until inflation's um, in check and the Fed has confidence with their data dependent approach in the market, they're, li they're less likely to make a move until they feel confident that number is uh, closer to that 2% target. Uh, and so the reaction in the market with Treasury yields rising, of course, uh, yields will rise if they don't expect the Fed to reduce rates. So if we want to look at the two and 10 year yield, um, uh, rates rose about 30, we'll call it mid 30, mid 30 basis points for the quarter. Um, more notably on the two year rose 37 basis points from 462. And since March 30th, we've had a CPI number that came in hotter than expected as well. So again, rates ro have, have risen since. As of yesterday, we were up about 23 basis points on the two-year treasury, putting it around 4.93% and starting to tease that 5% level that we saw back in October. This is the summary of economic projections, looking at the screen that the Fed puts out uh, about every other meeting. Uh, we talked about uh, back in December, their projections was around 1.4%. They've since lifted that to 2.1% GDP expectations for the year. 
unemployment rate. They're anticipating around 4%. We're still well below that. In fact, I think we're at 26 months of consecutive months under 4% unemployment rate. So we're currently at 3.8% unemployment um, within that 34 to 4% range. Uh, real remarkable there as well. Um, you won't, well, they're still showing three rate reductions on this projection that doesn't take into consideration any data we've gotten since March 20th when this was reported. Um, but I believe in June, my personal feeling is in June, and I think the market's going to start to uh, see a, a change in this Fed funds projection from themselves when they release this again in June. Um, just uh, a chart that kind of helps guide thoughts on where the yield curve is. We still have yields short term under one year, higher than long term rates. This inverted yield curve has set a record of 624 days inverted, um, a record la uh, last held from 1978. Typically, inverted yield curves, when you get higher yields from short term rates than long term rates, um, would not would not last uh, quite this long. Uh, but the but in the face of rising rates from the Fed over the past couple of years, uh, pausing last July, uh, again, the economy and the market just has uh, not, not shown where those short-term rates should come down. So those long-term rates are pricing in those adjustments where the short-term rates have remained elevated, um, pinned more to where the Fed funds rate is. Um, overall, if you look at market indices for different asset classes for the quarter, this might um, this will resonate more when we look at the portfolio performance, first quarter returns for U.S. Treasuries, just about flat given where current rates are, less market value changes on those because rates have risen, market values fall when rates rise. So we're about flat on Treasuries for the quarter. Um, the reason we would see market returns for the other asset classes tend to be because the market is very confident um, with corporate financials and balance sheets at the moment. So spreads have narrowed. Uh, the, the amount of return you get from a corporate or other credit products um, represented here, uh, those spreads have narrowed. Uh, so that helps market values. So despite the higher rates, we saw, we saw that effect with the credit asset classes. Um, and, and more of a summary of the information I, I, I spoke of. As we turn to the market, uh, excuse me, to the portfolio performance, the consolidated summary showing 101 million uh, approximately between two combined accounts. As you recall, uh, when we brought uh, the accounts over a couple years ago, prior to my time, um, there were some securities identified and segregated. Um, their CDs that are held in a segregated portfolio. Um, so we'll look at the managed portfolio at the moment. Uh, total value of that managed portfolio is just over a hundred million. Um, when we include uh, include accrued interest and cash in the account, uh, that cash is not necessarily cash, but um, uh, invested in in short term um, pool as well. We are measured in the portfolio against a one to five year treasury index. That one to five year treasury index benchmark has a duration of 2.5 years. We're shy of that uh, because of the dynamic of bringing in securities that had been held in the portfolio with the um, with rates having risen in that time. Um, we're being judicious about sales in the account um, and, and you know using discretion to make good judgment with um, the reinvestments of those securities in the portfolio when they make sense. Uh, we saw agencies decline a little bit from 81% in the portfolio previous quarter to 76%, looking to diversify um, asset classes in the portfolio. And we turn to um, commercial mortgage backs where they have the, the, um, the backing of government paper, agency paper, but spreads that haven't been necessarily impacted as we've seen in the other asset classes that I spoke of earlier. So we did increase the allocation to commercial mortgage-backed securities with maturities under five years. There was a good number of issuance that allowed us to capture some spread through that product. Um, as we continue to reinvest in the, in the portfolio, I should point out too, the yield at cost in the account 
has been rising to 1.6%. That's an improvement from last quarter of 1.4%. Michael, yes, sir. that's also an it's also an increase about fifty percent uh, from when you took the portfolio over. I remember we were down at, to one point six. So good job. I looked at that. Um, yeah, you're right. It is about double from where we were, and you know it, it's a, a dynamic of investment with the right asset classes trying to capture spread. When spreads widen out, we take a look at the volatility of spreads from treasuries. And if there isn't enough spread to warrant that credit investment, we look to treasuries um, where you can get the same level of, um, uh, of performance when spreads narrow and it doesn't make sense to do that. So I appreciate the acknowledgement on that and uh, I'll pass that along to the team. There's still work to do, of course. Yep. Um, a summary of transactions within the account. Um, we Again, I've mentioned commercial mortgage-backed securities, a great place for not credit risk because they're backed by uh, U.S. agencies or, or government-sponsored enterprises. Um, so we, we took good advantage of issues that um, came to market in the first quarter. So that's why we see a, a good uh, number of about 5.8 million purchased through the quarter we'll, using the proceeds of treasuries and agencies, either maturities or sales of those. And this is really kind of the, um, you know, I think the moment that everybody's been kind of been waiting for, you know, what would we do for the quarter? Uh, so this is that slide. Um, interest earned on the investments, 366000 Somehow we eked out a change in market value that didn't go down like I've seen in other portfolios based on higher rates. Um, so we, we eked out a, a change in market value higher of $5,000 for a total dollar return. Not necessarily realized, just... Uh, just reported as market-based or market value pricing of 371,000. Portfolio return in, in the quarter alone was up 0.37. Uh, I can't see that uh, net of fee return, but it's two basis points. So it's a 0.35% uh, return in the portfolio. I guess we hit hide there uh, for the quarter. Uh, so we outperformed the benchmark by 38 basis points. And for the full year, uh, we're, uh, we ran a net of fee return of 3.41% net of fees. Again, uh, this is market value based, but if we look at the accrual based earnings, of course we have the same amount of interest earned at 366,000. We did sell, as we saw on a previous slide, some treasuries and agencies. Um, at, at market losses because we were able to reinvest those in the commercial mortgage-backed securities to offset those losses in a quick manner and achieve higher yields in the portfolio over time. So total earnings, actual accrued based earnings of $261,000 for the quarter. We don't have data for the three and five years for anybody that might be new. Uh, because uh, it's a relatively new account. We don't have three or five years of data to report. I'll pause there. Um, again, express my appreciation for the time, but would appreciate questions if you have any. Chris, Ricky. Well, I just take looks good. Looks great. Good job. Thank you for the report. Karen? I would just reinforce that it, uh, the professionalism of this approach to managing our investments is really reassuring for members to know that we're under these capable hands and not being managed inside. <laughs> You're here. Yeah. Trevor. I have nothing. Looks good. I just doubled down on what Karen said. Thank you, uh, Jennifer directing this. Um, so Michael, I, I, yeah, I love what you guys are doing. You're getting us balanced. You're getting us into the right instruments. I, since we have to deal with a lot with interest rates and so you, you get the, you get the price index is going up 3.8%, but that's not including interest rates. And 
we yeah, there was a very robust retail sales in the last quarter. It was all fueled mainly by credit cards. And credit card interest rates are average 22%. So a lot of people are buying things that they may or may not be able to afford. But I guess the point I want to really make is that if you factor in the interest rates, which are much higher and much higher cost today than they were two years ago, we're living with about a 7% um, interest rate here, or 7% price index in increase. Uh, so inflation rate is really could be closer to 7% if you factor in the interest rates. And I wonder somehow that to me, that is kind of a forward prognosis of what's to come. So what I'd like to see is how do we factor that into this report to say that, yeah, here's the government figure of 3.5, 3.8, but if you're going to factor in interest rates with people or 50% of the American consumers paying high interest rates right now, how do we factor that into forward thinking for us? Because they do have an impact. They just can't be ignored. You know, Rich, I, I think I understand the question. And for the you know, for sectors in the economy that are 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 more levered, um, that that are reliant on interest rates, not all industries are 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 heavily leveraged. Um, but I think this reflection of the treasury curve. You know, I would tend to gravitate to this to answer that question. I'd be interested if, if other colleagues, um, you know, if, if they were on the call, how they would address that or our strategist. Um, I would look at this because the treasury curve is considered the risk-free curve. It's considered the curve that mortgages, you know, a 30-year mortgage, you'd look at the 10-year and, and as a duration and and price it from there and, and, and look at the spread of where you might get a mortgage. Um, and, I, and I think you're talking about borrowings as part of that inflation factor. And, yes. and not every industry is, and, and certainly credit cards. And if there is a reliance by consumers, uh, an increase of that, I'd be interested to see that and what they might be paying on that. Um, I don't know that credit cards are a great reflection of interest rates because they're so, um, they can be so high and they're, they're so um, diverse, if you will. Um, but that's the point. I mean, I think the point of the Fed keeping rates higher at the moment, they have control of short-term rates. They have control of that overnight rate. And again, it's in a restrictive area, particularly when you look at the past 10 or 20 years um, or 10 years or 15 years, you, you're in a five and a quarter to five and a half percent where we spent most of the past 10 years at a zero percent, which was also anomalous. It, very, it was a free flow of, of economic, you know, um, uh, ability to borrow at very affordable rates. Most of us have rates that we don't want to move because our mortgages are tied, you know, to very low indexes. Um, so, so now they're in a policy that restricts it, you know, and, and you, I think you just have to take data. Yes, there, there are changes over time to the indexes and we hear about that. And there's always question, um, you know, about uh, what factors, you know, led to that number. And I think that's been true across time. I, I don't think that it's just a one-time thing. It's been you know, it's evaluated and reassessed and, and recalibrated um, to try to reflect what's happening in the economy because productivity changes. Um, we have advances in technology that make things more efficient. So to measure things the way we did from, say, 1950 um, have an impact on these economic data points. And, and I think they're, you know, they are doing their best to try to incorporate how do we measure what we used to in a, and, equalize, um, and equalize that information across time. So I think you know that that's part of the equation as well, but as to speak to the interest rates, they're keeping it restrictive based on the economic data that's coming in. Um, there's going to be different industries that are more reliant on interest rates that make it more costly, and that's really what they're trying to slow down. They're trying to impact those um, those sectors from um, overly expansive growth and unhealthy growth. Sorry, that so, may have been a long-winded, no, and I hope I touched on your answer, on your question. No, it's a good point. But um, so the U.S. government used to have interest payments of about what 400 billion a year. Now it's up to 800 billion that they have to borrow. Um, 
So their their debt has increased from 400 billion to 800 billion. That drives up. Uh, you don't if you don't have the big supply of money, uh, that supply that increases the demand and increases the interest rate they'll have to pay, and they are paying higher interest rate to to get that money. Uh, so is the consumer, and I'm just wondering if somehow that doesn't have an impact on us, not only in our investment end, but also if we had to do a bond or borrowing end, um, can we? Can that be forecast, or can that be indicated that there's, here's the trend, and we need to watch out for it? It could be simple as a one one sentence. Yeah, I think this yield curve does that. I think the short term rates at five and a quarter percent, five uh, currently five and a quarter to five and a half percent. This trend of the of the U.S. Treasury yield curve shows rate the trend of rates will decline over time. Um, separately, I don't have access to, but we we can look at futures rates on where at certain points in the future, for example, the two year yield is expected to price in a in a one year forward or a two year forward market. Um, but those tend to be volatile. They tend, you know, they, they will move around. It's not a, it's not an answer. It's not a prediction, an eight ball. Nobody has that, but it's where sure. the market is pricing future rates. Okay. Well, I, I just, I, do, I, I don't disagree I don't, on, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. Huh? Well, I, I guess I don't trust the Fed rate as much, but I do trust the, uh, the 10 and the 30 and they're both 40 points. 40 basis points higher than three months ago. I mean, the 30 is up to 4.7 and 6, I think, right now, and the 10 years 4.67. So they both are going up, and, and yeah, they fluctuate. I just, that trend disturbs me more than the Fed not moving or moving their interest rates because I think that's the true market for me. That, that's not a, it's not political. It's okay. Here's the amount of money we have. We can, we'll, we'll lend it to you at, at that rate. So anyway, no, thank you. You guys are still, you're, you're doing a great job. I just appreciate it. I just, uh, I, w I think I just wanted to see more texture in some of these because um, it's just not so cut and dried. It's a very difficult job you're doing. Well, you know, PFM doesn't set treasury rates. The market certainly does. It's a free market of buyers and sellers. The Fed owns quite a bit of it themselves. Um, I don't disagree that you mentioned they are paying interest higher for the 800 billion. I don't have the numbers, but I've heard it around a trillion uh, per year on debt based on higher rates. Um, but I would say they as we, we're all paying this. This is our, we are the people. So it's our money. And, um, you know, we, you know, we, I think we have to be aware of that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Thanks so much. All right. Consent agenda. I would move to approve the consent agenda. I'll take that. Oh, go ahead, Chris. I'll take that. Um, <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> no, it's not too late. I wanted to pull one item, the Cement Hill, and, and I just have some questions about it because we haven't seen this in a long time. And 4D? Represent the area. Yeah, 4D. I wanted to just pull that for discussion. Purposes. Okay. Would you amend that? I will uh, amend, and I would ask to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item 4D. I second that. Okay. Do we have any public comment? Seeing none, uh, roll call, please. Aye. Aye. Four. Aye. Division one. Yes. Division five. Yes. Okay, item 4D. Thank you, everybody. Um, so this is an area that I represent, and I looked at this very carefully last night and came up with a couple of questions. And um, one of them is, do we charge an interest rate for those delinquencies? I believe an interest rate is, it ends up being a lien on the property. I know that so it, the, yeah, the, the, the tax itself is a lien, but I'm wondering if it, for the delinquencies, if it continues to accrue, 
um, interest. I, Dustin is saying yes. I think it's, uh, I think it's set by statute at 1.5% yeah. per month, something like that. 1.5% per month. Um, thank you. 18% per year. Right. I believe so. That's going uh, off of faint memory. But. Uh -huh. I think that's correct. Okay. And um, then could someone explain to me what the backup special tax is? Which page are you yeah. at? Um, well, let's see. Here it more for the moment. I really appreciate my colleagues letting me take the time here because this is confusing. And when I get are asked, you talking about in the tables by assessor parcel? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I will have to clarify with our consultant. I believe the backup special tax is is associated with it being re-amortized when there's different payment schedules and when the home is sold, mm -hmm. uh, but I'll confirm for you and report back on that. Okay. And it's either equal to or less than what the maximum special tax is. Mm -hmm. okay. And I see that the overall delinquency rate um, is, 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 is just less than 2%. Is that is that how I'm reading this? Is that correct? Yeah, and that would be page normal. 41. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it seems you know, pretty good, actually. Um, I was surprised to see that be so low. And um, and then how long are, is this bond, how long until it's completed? Or is it a, it's not a bond? It's, not a it's an assessment to forever. both Rodeo Flat and right. Cement Hill. They are mm -hmm. assessment districts that perform to be able to issue debt and pay the debt service. Right. One is a bond and one is a state revolving fund loan with State Water Resources Control Board. They both have different terms. They are both fairly close to being completed. I want to say it's, there's like six and eight years left, but I'll confirm for you. Yeah, that's I was wondering. Is, is this a perpetuity yeah. thing or, no. you know, when? <laughs> Most bonds, unless a bond is issued or the assessment district is formed with a second issuance in mind mm -hmm. or some other type of infrastructure costs that are supposed to be recovered through the assessment district in the original formation documents, the assessment is over based off of the term, and it's usually 20 or 30 years. Okay, that's kind of what I thought. But this has been here for a while. I think yeah. it's been around for 11 or 12 years. Yeah. yeah. So we're yeah. getting close on both of them. Right. Okay. One so I'd be interested to know when they when the sunset date is or the completion date or whatever. And we can bring that back. How about I, I commit to bring back a more thorough workshop <clears throat> item just on the status of them? I do have some ideas about those particular bonds, so it Great. would also be a good opportunity to dive a little bit deeper into them because there are some pri uh, priorities for payoff, and uh, we are getting very close to paying some of them off as well. Thank you. And then, and then, lastly, when a property sells and changes hands, are uh, are the is it possible that they pay the, their share of that assessment in full, or are they still continuing to pay yearly? Both. We Both. oftentimes get people pay off the assessment. Uh huh. Because I wonder if they wrap that in their loans. You know. They, they do. They do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so that's the unpaid portion if they sell their house. Just yep. The portions of them, a number of years that they still would pay if they lived there. We also have folks that come in prepaid so that they don't have to pay the interest on it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw that there was some prepaid. Yep. Okay. We get some prepaid every year. Um, well, thank you. I, that ends my questions. I just wanted more information. I appreciate you wanting to bring or bringing that back so we can really yeah, understand both. Yeah, that's been an idea for a while. Huh? Have, it's been an idea for a while, so I think it's time to. I think that's great. We'll thank you so much. Lunch. That concludes my question. Any more comments? Jennifer, you, you, it sounded like you intend to do this, but just to confirm, I would be interested to know how this financing mechanism could be used to support uh, district water treated water line extension, given that we don't have the Duffley anymore, and really understanding kind of how the district would evaluate the pros and cons of this approach um, and how it might lead to a strategy going forward. Yes, we, these we, assessment yeah. districts are special benefit districts. Mm -hmm. So in order to form a special benefit district, you have to identify the special benefit that would be received by mm -hmm. the parcels that are included within the district. And then it actually has to go to a vote with those parcels. Within those parcels, right. That's how this would work. We, talk, we talked about those things when we were uh, going through the 
deal of the FWLE. Yeah, the, the it, it, it is an yeah, option. So. Um, it is a little bit of a difficult option when you already have a large number of parcels in the area. You also see right, right. cities or counties form these type of assessment districts mm -hmm. when there is larger property owners, like one developer owns the property, because then they're only counting one or two votes. Right. Um, it is doable, though, and especially with the neighborhood who might not have access to treated water currently, it's definitely a viable opportunity for them to finance a large infrastructure project. Yeah, this took a lot of coordination. I know Nancy and, um, yeah. and Hank Weston put, helped put this together with the county, and they had a lot of partners you know, that, that created this, and it's, I think it's been really great for the folks up yeah. in Cement Hill, and it adds to property values, blah, 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 yeah. but it makes it, you know, their wells fail up there all the time. Yes, they do. So this has been a really good option for them. Yes, I, I agree. And, I mean, you might expand if if there are other opportunities that, that we don't know about. It just seems like uh, having a strategy around expansion of treated water is something that we should be doing as part of thinking our, about it. Yeah, yeah our long term plan. Yep, I agree. Okay, thank you. Any public comment? Okay, um, Mr. President, I would move approval of item 4D, Community Facilities District number 2007. Hill. Second. second. Karen seconds. All right. Roll call, please. Thank you. Aye. 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 Four. 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 Aye.
and a variety of other folks and also just, you know, individuals that work for PG&E that are also um, NID customers at levels. And so um, we're singularly focused on completing the repairs necessary to resume water delivery. Uh, that work is occurring around the clock, seven days a week. Um, I do know that um, from the operational standpoint, I believe there are twice weekly meetings that are occurring with your team. And uh, we certainly appreciate that collaboration. We do acknowledge the weight of the situation. Um, but with that, I just wanted to let you know that I'm a resource to you. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions to the extent that I'm able. And um, I will continue to attend these meetings uh, through to resolution of the situation. Great. And, and note, you live locally. I do. I'm, a, I'm, a, yeah, I'm an NID customer in Ofer. Oh. Yeah. So, did you start? Okay, Ricky, sorry. You wanna, did, did you have something? Go ahead and start. I, I have Trevor, like I have a couple of I just have questions. Oh, no. Okay. So we're very focused on the horn and Spalding too. Um, I don't get much information on the South Yuba Canal repair. The the pipe. Yeah. So um, yeah, my understanding is that we're um, uh, completing some uh, scaling and uh, making safe. Uh, above the pipe, including um, uh, removing hazardous rocks and lashing some rocks to the cliffside. Um, I understand that to be ongoing. I do think uh, I've heard that we're looking at possibly alternative materials that we might be able to get in a more timely fashion to uh, bring some degree of water conveyance back through that portion of the system. Um, I would look to uh, your operations team as they coordinate with our folks to get further updates on that, but um, that work is ongoing. We're making safe. Uh, it's going to require us to uh, remove some of the damaged pipe, and again, I think we are looking at alternative material types that we can get in a more timely manner. Yeah, one of the things to note about the repair of the spalding pipe, so not only does the spalding pipe need to be repaired, but also does the spalding tube powerhouse, mm -hmm. and those items are being scheduled and worked on. What is a little unknown at this time is PG&E has looked at different options for a temporary fix to the spalding pipe section, um, but that hasn't been completely fleshed out yet. One of the challenges with the repair of the spalding pipe is a very long lead time on materials. So they've been trying to source alternative materials to bring in earlier and or put in a temporary solution while also addressing the issues at the spalding tube powerhouse. And that spalding tube powerhouse has to be fixed for water to be then put into the pipe. So as soon as we hear more about some more definite answers about temporary solution, we'll make sure that the board is aware. So we have Juan Brown at the air attack base. Juan, go ahead. Morning, Brandon. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, um, sir. Okay, great. Hey, uh, let's see. First off, the um, discharge horn repair, is that in a Spalding Powerhouse number one or number two? Number one. Number one, which is the upper, um, the upper powerhouse, correct? That is correct. Okay, and um, the repairs that are being made to the discharge horn is. It, uh, do you know much about the construction of the discharge horn? Is this a case of, um, uh, well, the narrative that's out there is uh, neglected infrastructure but was there not some work that was done on this discharge horn back in 2011 that you're having to come back and redo uh i'm not entirely sure i'd have to follow up on that um i do know that we have you know maintenance intervals and inspection intervals and things like that but um i'm not i'm not privy to that level of detail yeah, it'd be good to, if we can get the technical information as to what happened there, what the timeline is, and um, uh, if there was some previous work that needs to be reworked on that horn. And I assume, does anybody there know, is the horn simply just a concrete tube or is it a concrete steel tube? And, and do we know what failed there? My understanding is the horn itself is constructed of stainless steel encased in concrete. Inside of it. <clears throat> Say again, Jennifer. It, it's a concrete structure, but it's lined with um, steel. Got it. Okay. And then the failure of that is what um, also caused problems with the footings for the powerhouse itself. Correct? 
Um, I, I do believe that it's just a result of the, the high pressure and volume of water working through there. Um, you know, I think it's something in the neighborhood of 300,000 gallons a minute um, under pressure. So, you know, obviously water is one of the most powerful natural forces on earth. So um, that's what we're facing. Uh, very good. Um, the river valve outlet system, is there problems with the valves there? Will we have a dead pool situation with Spalding uh, this summer with the inability to get water out of Spalding once the uh, spillway stops spilling? I take the term dead pool to mean like extreme low level. And I don't think that will be the case with Spalding. I do know, I was told yesterday that uh, we will be delaying the opening of the recreation facilities there to allow for the unimpeded flow of personnel and material in and out of the site. Um, but I, I don't believe that Spalding would be at Deadpool if the meaning of that is mostly empty. Well, I mean, no, I mean, the water level is going to come down to a point where it stops spilling over the spillway. And then how does water come out of Spalding? for the rest of the summer until these repairs are made? I believe the water would remain until the water deliveries resume once the repairs are completed. Okay, so the water's... So we basically have a dead pool we're, uh, at Spalding until which time that we can begin to move water out of Spalding? I think there's just a little bit of confusion regarding yeah. the word dead pool. We yeah. utilize that word in the industry to mean that the reservoir has dropped down to... Um, level where it can no longer get out of the low level outlet. In this particular situation, Spalding would not be having reduced surface water elevations such in that nature. Um, it's more of a challenge right now getting water out of Spalding. So I did it come off spill yet, Chip? So Spalding is still spilling. Once Spalding stops <coughs> spilling and prior to the time period when the partial repair is made, water will not be moving past Spalding. Got it. Okay, good. And still the sequence of events is uh, to fix one of the discharge horns in Spalding number one. And once we get that done, we'll be able to start moving a bit of water through both canal systems. Correct? Um, I believe that is not the case, um, but I would need to defer to those with operational expertise. I'm not entirely sure how to answer that. Yeah. I'm, I'm the repair of the single horn will allow water to go down to Rollins. There, we're looking at about 400 CFS. Um, the pipe and the repairs to Spalding 2 need to be made or a temporary repair to either restore full or partial flows down into Scott's flat. But we can divert. Can we not divert some water? As Chip was explaining uh, last last meeting, we can divert some water from the Drum Canal down into the Yuba Canal via the Nevada connection there. To get and some, we're looking at them. Yeah. Part of the water is correcting me right now. Part of the water, I believe it was 50 CFS trying to get over. So we would have about 350 CFS to work with. 300 would go down to Rollins. We try to push about 50 CFS to go over to that. Okay, good. Okay, yeah, Brandon, if we can get some technical answers to some of these questions, it'll really help with the narrative of what's going on with PGE up there at Spalding. And uh, we'll look forward to getting that information from you soon. Thanks so much. Thank you, Juan. If you could uh, perhaps send your contact information, or maybe I can get it from someone here in the room, I'll be sure to follow up. Yeah. Okay, sure, we'll do. And send, and send a list of your questions. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, concerned citizen, we're going to wait and go to Ricky. Um, thank you. Um, Brandon, thank you so much for being here today. And, and I really do hope you're able to join us in all future meetings so that we can have this exchange, not only with the board, but with the community so that they are able to ask their questions directly. So I encourage you to continue to come back. So thank you. Um, so what is the update on the timing of the temporary repair? And should that, and when that happens, what are the expected flows? I'm talking about the, uh, the canal, the Yuba Canal. What are the expected flows once you achieve the temporary repair what kind of flows do you think you'll get out of that? Because the 350 CFS we're talking about is the horn. It's not the canal, or it's not the pipe. Is that correct? Correct. So yeah. That's what's still being worked out with related to a temporary repair based off of what size pipe would need to be kind of strung up and how that would work while they could still access the 
main section to do the permanent repair. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. We don't have exact details on that answer yet. Okay. And so, do you have? Does PG&E not you? But does PG&E have a, a, a plan or a schedule, construction plan and timing for that temporary repair? My understanding is that design's being finalized. Um, I, I do know that we're very focused on the mid-June time frame for restoring water deliveries through that damaged horn. Um, I would have to go back to the team and get a more detailed update on the the other items. I'd like okay. to hear that. The, the same question I had is, is like we have a date, at least something that we're working to. I don't feel like I'm informed enough to understand what we're working to on the other side with right. all the two and, and right. the, now. There is a preliminary schedule um, that has not been yet finalized, but recall, we, staff has seen it per our coordinated operating agreement. Um, pg e has asked us to not disperse it, but we could potentially, I think it's a great ask, if we could share that schedule with the board. Right. Can I, uh, Director, uh, um, on that subject, can I ask a question? Of course. On the pipe? Yeah. Uh, I saw a picture. Somebody hiked up there and took a picture. Could you give us an idea of the scope or the, the magnitude? Because it's it's hard to it's hard to see from those photos. Right, from yeah. a photo, I saw a photo looked like about a 20 foot section is all, but I could be way off on that. It looks like it came off. Does it sit on a ledge and it rolled down the hill? Is that what happened to the pipe? And how how big a price? I, I, I can speak to it in, in general terms. So I believe it's a greater than 50 inch diameter steel pipe. Um, it sits on a bench, um, essentially on a granite cliff face. Right. Um, some of it is supported by um, dry masonry. Some of it is supported by cribbing and scaffolding. Um, it's a major undertaking. It's going to involve climbers. It's going to involve helicopters. But how much of the 50-inch yeah, pipe? How long is it 20 feet? Is it 100 feet? Um, I want to say it's a couple couple hundred. I, I, can, oh, get a, I can get a specific number. Um, I'm going to be leaning on the recording of this meeting to, to track questions because I'd like to just stay focused on the conversation. But um, I'll okay, carry okay. That back. And it was that, a rock that, that, that occurred from up above. Understood. Yeah. That and and um, there was a really uh, compelling visual, um, I believe, posted by Ubinet that pans from mm -hmm. high elevation to the top of the cliff. And I mean, even I was pretty shocked that they could even construct something in that location. Too. <laughs> That's pretty astounding. So this is a big. This is a big. Deal. It is a big I mean, deal. It's a so, big, bigger problem than I was guessing. But once that temporary repair is complete, what are the expected flows? This is, we're talking just that um, pipe right now. I, I don't have that answer at the moment, Director Heck, but I'll certainly carry it back and, and follow up with what okay. I can. And, um, and do you know what the timing of the procurement of the piping is? Because I understand part of the problem is is getting the the materials necessary to do this. Do you have any updates that you can give us on the timing? Uh, my understanding is we're looking at uh, multiple approaches, including an alternative material. Um, I don't have line of sight into the timing of delivery on steel piping, but um, I know that we're looking at creative solutions to avoid any further delay. Okay. And then what is the timing of doing that final, um, the rock stabilization that you guys, that, that, that there was in, I think it was Paul Moreno in his memo or his email or something said that, that ultimately there was going to be some rock stabilization done above. So to yeah, that's happening in real time. It's happening in real time. Yes. How, what, what kind of materials are you using for that? Um, well, we have geotechnical experts that are, you know, assessing it, you know, section by section. I, I understand that some rocks are being removed, some rocks are being lashed uh, or tethered to the side of the cliff. Um, trees, tree, trees, are, trees are being removed. That's just how I understand it from how uh -huh. it was told to me. But um, basically, just assessing for central threats to the pipe below, mm -hmm. um, across that affected section, and even beyond the affected section. But the the rock uh, stabilization work is ongoing, and it's likely happening now, and will continue for several. Years. Okay, and thank you. And what is the schedule for the permanent fix? I mean, when do you guys anticipate the permanent fix? for that section being completed? I don't have that answer, Director Heck, at the moment. <clears throat> I don't know. Okay. I, I, there, there are probably people at PG&E that do know. I just, I'm not privy to that information at the moment. So. Okay. Ricky, I have a connection with that. So that permanent fix will probably not correspond to our irrigation season, <laughs> but it might be in the off season. How does that impact our refill of Scott's flat? for next year, for 2025? 
Um, that I, I really don't have a good answer for other than to say that we're looking to restore those uh, facilities as, as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. I know that uh, it's a singular focus for the team here locally, um, but I don't have specific date as to when that's going to come back into service. How many people, when you say you've got a team? laughing at your response. <laughs> when you say you have a team working 24-7, you know, I'm interested in, you know, is that... 25 people? Is it 100 people? Is it five people? Can you, I, I think can you give us a sense of how much, how many, how much resources PG&E has put on? Sure. It's, it's a very large team, but in terms of people physically working uh -huh. in the substructure of the powerhouse, I believe they can only fit like maybe six or eight people in there at a time just because it's such a tight Understood. And workspace. And those folks are, um, I believe, either completing or have completed the demolition work and are beginning to uh, prep for uh, Re reconstructing the horn structure and the, the so you have a team working on the pipe and a team working on the horn is yes that yes absolutely and not to mention all the different you know uh, engineers geotechnical experts variety of <laughs> that aren't <laughs> certainly supporting the project um chip i didn't want to in you know did you want to say something? Because I still have, by the way, everyone, I still have a bunch of questions. So. It's a good question, but the refill for Scotts Flat uh, in the off season will be dependent upon the repairs to the South Yuba Canal and and, and uh, having access to flows into that. Um, we have indicated our and need and desire to have some flows in that during the off season, and so I think PG is looking at the options analysis to see how they can attempt to keep close to us while they're working on the other one. So still preliminary, but uh, we have indicated that we would like to see flows in that to help us refill. Uh, do you have an idea of like when you talk about the flows coming in to help us fill Scott's flat, like when, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of the timing, when would that need to occur in order to help Scott's flat? I mean, if they can't get this repair done until next June, we're not going to refill Scott's flat, but if they could get it done, I don't know. October, November, the temporary pair I'm talking about. And well, there's two different scenarios we're dealing with. One is we are running short on supply to our canal system. The sooner we get those repairs in place, even if they're temporary, and get some flows down into Deer Creek, it will help us with um, shorting any raw water customers on the Deer Creek side. Okay, that's one portion of this. The second portion of this is how do we refill Scott's after irrigation season's over? Mm -hmm. And the key to that will be we'll, we will need flows in the off-season to help okay. do that. There's not enough watershed in there to refill Scott's naturally. We definitely need to import them. Um, historically, we have up to about 75 CFS that comes down and into Deer Creek from the South Yuba Canal. In winter months, that drops down to about 35 during storm events. So mm -hmm. we're going to lean a little bit heavily on in between those storm events to ramp that thing back up and get the water refill in as, as quickly as possible. Okay. On an average year, the watershed of Scott's Flat will contribute how much? How many acre feet? I don't have that number off the top of my head. Yeah, but it's so heavy on imports that it's really not a huge, huge number that we play in there. Gotcha. What, what's the max? So you said 75 is like what we normally have, 35 in the winter. What's like the maximum capability of that conveyance? Uh, just roughly. With the head, it's 107. At the end, I don't think we've gotten over 80 in my recent career. So I think that's so not like you can double it to fill faster. No, that we're maxing out that system. Okay. Can we can we just say how important this is for next year? <laughs> Absolutely. And I um I'll carry that back, and you know, ideally at the next meeting. Okay. Direct questions to the appropriate folks. Would it be also? Will you have these questions prior to the meeting, and we can put post them, or the answers to the questions prior to the meeting? We can post them on nidwater.com, so people can see the answers before they come here. Is that possible? Uh, that'd be entirely. Yeah, the I can. I can. I can certainly work toward that. Uh, okay. As many as you can. Absolutely. Okay. May I continue? You got it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, you're Thanks, good. everybody's patience. You're, you're bringing up the right questions. questions. Well, good. Um, okay, so then next, so I'm moving now from the um, pipe into the horns, okay? So um, could you please update us on the timing to repair horn one? I understand we have now a new date of June 18th, 
and it slid, I don't know, three, four, or five times in in this many weeks. Um, do, so could you tell us with certainty when you expect to have that Horn 1 at least partially operational for the 350 CFS? June 18th. June 18th. Yes. Okay, and that is with the, the date we've provided. Of course, there's always the possibility of, you know, um, issues that may arise. I know that um, the slip, I think, was from the 12th to the 18th, involved um, some additional LIDAR surveying that needed to occur. That's what I saw, yeah. So, um, but all indications I've been given are that we're still targeting mid-June. So. Okay. Can you talk a little bit more about that? So, how, um, what variables have you kind of locked down that make you feel confident that June 18th is the date? So, in other words, we've got the materials all ordered and, we're, and ready to come in. We have the work schedule of staff. We've completed all the analysis that is required to know the work plan. I mean, because like the LIDAR analysis. So that was added a variable. Um, so I, I just, I, I'm with Ricky as wanting to try and understand, um, do we have a high degree of confidence in this or is it more like, well, this is our best information at the moment, but we still don't know, can we get the materials in? Do we have the right. technical capability? Yeah, I have, I have a higher degree of confidence there. Um, we have brought in um, some very uh, specialized contractors um, that uh, are familiar with the type of work that we need to do there. We also have our uh, gener general construction crews or personnel up there. Um, this is, you know, June 18th is the date based on the projected duration of each of the sequential steps to complete the project. Um, so I know at this point, I believe demolition is either near or at completion. So that was obviously the critical first step and opening everything up, prepping it for the work that's uh, to ensue. But um, I have a high degree of confidence in our team. Uh, like I said, this is a singular focus. It has the attention of everyone at the company locally and, and at the highest levels of leadership. So um, I would just say I'm very confident in the June 18th date. Things happen, of course, you know, it's um, a challenge, but I think that the fact that this is such a focal point for the company and such a high priority for not only us, but for all of the um, affected stakeholders, I, I think we're going to do everything we can to make that date. So, Thank you. Um, can you then um, let me know or let us know whether you can provide a detailed construction schedule to NID staff? It's like we're going to do this, then this, then this, so that we get a, what you talked about, the sequential steps. Have that, has that been shared with NID staff, and can you do that if it hasn't? I believe a, a version of a schedule has been shared with Jennifer and her team. Um, if uh, you know, I, I know that there's conversations at the on the operational side that are seeking further detail. I would have to defer to those folks. Huh. We are still needing some detail fleshed out. Um, just so the board knows, the schedule was transferred or submitted to NID staff underneath the con confidentiality provisions of our coordinated operating agreement. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that we can choose to make public. That would entirely be the decision of PG. Understand, yeah. understand. But it seems like you could make that schedule available to staff confidentially, so it did not violate the terms of the. I believe that we have. They have. They're still just flushing. They're flushing it out. Yeah, okay. there's some additional details that um, we've received several versions of the stuff. The first schedule, the first version was extremely high level. Um, as even just as of this Monday, we received more and more detail. Um, the detail related to the repair of the horn is mm -hmm. sufficient. I think that okay. we can tell what the plan is. It's the details related to the repair of the pipes that are not quite flushed out yet. Okay. And also the spalding to powerhouse issues are Understood. pretty well flushed out. So then my question is, can this, so you're going to do the, the partial repair to the to horn one so that we can get some flows. Can that happen? Can those repairs be done <coughs> given that you have a collapsed foundation? No, the foundation hasn't collapsed. It was a, a I believe a pair of columns, structural columns. And right, structural columns. Well, I'm using Paul Moreno's language, so. Those, those are, um, I believe that those have been demoed and they're shoring in place and that they're going to begin construction on new columns. And I believe those columns are going to be uh, much more robust. So the they're, answer is they're... yes, it, the water can go through the horns while you are completing the repairs that the foundational no, the, repairs. The structural columns need to be completed um, um, concurrently with the repair to the damage. Uh -huh. And so then the date of June 18th would also then have to apply to the structural columns. That is correct. And the reason that we're 
doing the single horn and the columns is that we can't work on both horns and the columns concurrently. There's just simply not enough workspace. And so that's why the, the decision was made in, in cooperation with your team to uh, focus on the structural uh, work and then the, one of the two conveyance structures. Can I ask a related question? Sure. Um, so can you confirm the historical flow that is able to be managed in that repaired horn. So has it always been able to carry 350 to 400 CFS? Because we're looking at 400 CFS coming through. I, I believe that when when both horns were in service, I want to say it was somewhere around 760 CFS is what I've been told. So I think that is historically what has been conveyed through that structure. Okay. And these, these two horns are all in one in the, in the number one powerhouse. Yes. Okay. So then, um, continuing to build on my questions here, and I thank you for your patience. Of course. Absolutely. Um, could you give us a detailed explanation on the collapse of those columns? I mean, it seems like, you know, I, I come from the real estate industry, and things don't just go along, 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 and they collapse unless there's an earthquake. So what, what led up to that collapse? Was it lack of maintenance? Was it... I mean, you tell me, why did that stuff collapse, and and can you give us a detailed explanation as to why that happened? I don't have a, a detailed ex explanation. I will say, as I mentioned earlier, you know, water being the most powerful natural force on Earth, you've got constant pressurized flow through there, very high, right. and so naturally that's going to, you know, have an effect on on structures over time. Um, I don't believe that there was any sort of neglect in play here. I think it was simply that. Um, but wouldn't you have gotten some sort of, seen some cracks or seen some, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, when I see a foundation beginning to crack and move and stuff, I, you know that, it's, that there's something going on there. And so, Mike, I, I'm just baffled as to why this just suddenly collapsed without anybody going, oh, hello, there might be a problem coming down the pike, and maybe we should go look at it and get it fixed before it becomes a bigger problem. I would say that's exactly what happened. You know, we were doing our inspections. We noticed an abnormality, and so we brought in a robot to go in and take a look. This is all typically underwater, so it's not something you can visibly inspect um, without dewatering mm -hmm. the, the tunnel, which and it also has its own challenges because if you're decreasing and increasing pressure multiple times, that has an effect on equipment too. Um, so I would say that we did exactly that. We did the inspection, we noticed an abnormality, uh, we continued to investigate further and ultimately decided to dewater the tunnel, um, which at that point in time we discovered uh, the damage and began work to repair it. So, so that, what you just described, happened sort of simultaneously with um, the shutdown of the horns? And so when you were looking about how to repair the horns is when you discovered, I'm just trying to get a sense of the timing, like which came first? It was, it was all concurrent. It was all concurrent. In the inspections, as they progressed and got into more detail, <coughs> visibility onto the equipment, it was all concurrent. Uh -huh. uh, I do want to just go back real quick yes. to the ability to transfer 400 CFS through right. a single horn. Um, we have, staff has requested additional data to substantiate mm -hmm. that theory, and I think pg and is still working through that request. The single horn, to our knowledge, has not ever transferred 400 CFS. Yeah, I was, that was, I was going to get there. But thank you for that. Yeah. Can I, can I, yes. kind of just, um, I understand, Brandon, that there was uh, some inspection work done in fall of last year, around September, October. And I'm wondering, that identified the need to make some degree of repairs in the area. So what is the, kind of what's the um, progress from that discovery to when the, oh, well, we have a major problem. I mean, I'd, I'd just like to understand a little sure. bit more about what the company was doing then and then how it led up to the new discovery. Yeah, I believe what you're referring to is, is two separate things. So there was an inspection completed that identified some coding that needed to be uh, repaired or replaced. That's wholly separate from the situation we find ourselves in now with the repairs to the horns and structural columns. That's um, Those are essentially unrelated because that inspection, I believe, last fall was not in the submerged portion of the facility. It was inside the, the ground. 
unfortunately. Is the horn result. failure and the foundation failure totally orthogonal? They just happen to happen at the same time? Or did one lead to the other? Um, I, I can't really say. I mean, we, we noticed the, the abnormality, did the inspections, and determined, you know, the path to the repair. I, I don't know if, if one preceded the other. We just discovered the two at the same time. I don't, I don't know. It hasn't been figured out if one caused. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's causality between the two. I, I don't know. Um, okay, I'm going to continue if that's okay. Thank you. If you want to take a break, we do concern. Citizen. No, I don't need it. I'm good. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> <that>. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you. Um, so, uh, it, back to the columns. Um, how are they going to be repaired, and do they actually really need replacement versus just a patch or a repair? I believe they need to be fully reconstructed, <laughs> and I, I believe I heard that we were going to clad them in steel also. You know what? I'm sorry. Clad, clad them in steel. Uh -huh. and, and, and right now you're still saying that data June 18th will hold to do the complete reconstruction of those foundational columns, columns in the first form, yes. Columns in the first form. I hope you do. Ah, uh, so do I. <laughs> because our community is at risk, Certainly. as I'm sure you know. I understand. I empathize. Um, okay. We have, you know, I've got coworkers from, you know, people with a small garden to a legacy ranch in rural Lincoln that irrigates 113 acres mm -hmm. that's already, you know, taken a half half a haircut on that. So we're, we're all very concerned. Yeah. Many of our agricultural customers are, well, I would say all of our agricultural customers are extraordinarily concerned. Yes, we and are. And it will impact all of the crops that are grown here. And so this is an enormous potential crisis that can't be understated or overstated. Understood. And as I shared, this is our singular focus and um, we're going to go all gas, no brakes until it's done. Okay. And then um, you may have answered this, but just, I have to go in my, in my person, please. Okay. So can that horn operate with the collapse foundation? I think you said no. It has to. To be, to be clear, the foundation didn't collapse. No, I know. Well, the structural. foundational columns, right. Um, no, they would have to in order for it to withstand the pressure of the rewatered canal or tunnel, it, the, they would both have to be fully prepared prior to doing that. Okay. And then um, has that underwater portion that where the problem occurred, has that been um, routinely inspected? And if so, at what frequency? The underwater portion that is providing this problem. Yeah, I believe it has, but I don't know what the, uh, the intervals are on that, I, I'd have to ask. It'd be really great if we could see, if the public could see, um, you know, the frequency of the frequency of the maintenance and what the, or I'm sorry, of the inspections, and then what were the results? Like, did you get a hint ten years ago when it was done, or you know, you know, what I'm saying just to be able to put some brackets around mm -hmm. how is this being done going forward, and then that would inform how we all look at this you know, for the future so that this does not happen again. I can ask about inspections. I, my understanding is like with any portion of our system, whether it's power generation, electric gas, we have uh, inspection intervals. Um, so. Right. It'd be nice to know what the inspection interval was for that specifically that has now collapsed. Okay. And again, it didn't collapse. The <laughs> columns failed. Well, I'm sorry, but I, I'm, I'm using Paul Moreno's language, so I, 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 I'm not the expert. I'm just using his language. If, if the structure had collapsed, we would it would be a far different conversation if, if okay. the actual structure had collapsed. Um, and then what is your schedule to repair the second horn? My understanding is that we would look to um, the off-season um, and take an additional outage to further complete the total suite of, of work that needs to occur there. After October 15th. Yeah. Okay, and okay. that was kind of my follow-up to that was, um, while that repair is underway for the Horn 2, will there need to be, con you know, uh, outages? And well, I, believe it would I would believe it would have to be taken uh, back out of service, but that wouldn't be a decision that we would make in concert with Jennifer and her team. It would have to be taken out of service. It would. My okay. guess is that we're pushing them to do that on October 16th. I mean, yes. be serious, like Absolutely. right away. Yes. The, right the sooner is done, the better. Is there a timeline for repair of that system? I have not. Um, there is. I've not seen it, but I've seen it. There is one. There is one. Okay. But the concern is that it's not going to be done before snow comes, 
and they right. or or the area becomes inaccessible, and then we are the area shouldn't become it. You can still access that area even in the snow. Really? You had a big enough machine in there, you can do just about anything. So. Okay, well, that is good news. And so then I would assume that is in your plan for future um, repair and or replacement of components to say, oh, it's weather dependent would not be an, uh, a reason to not carry it <coughs> forward. Yeah, there, there might be situations where we get six, eight, 10 feet of snow in a very short period of time, and that's going to require us to do snow removal and make the area safe in order to allow for ingress and egress. I mean, the road down into Spalding is pretty steep and narrow, so, um, but. Uh, that's why we have big snow caps that you just. Right, right, yeah. Um, there's certainly the possibility of, of weather delays, but I don't think it would be of any extended duration. It would just take us some time to. It's not a season. It's not like a construction season window would close. It's okay. more of day need two or three days. But I. Listening to the board's questions, which I think they're really good questions, I think it'd be very helpful if pg e would take consideration of releasing the schedule. Yes, I will carry that back. Okay. So then um, that plays right into my next question, which is, what is your estimated time for all of these outages? And if you would please provide a detailed schedule to NID of what you're perceiving these outages to be. Well, I believe Jennifer and her team have the schedule. Again, that's sort of governed by the conditions agreement which I certainly no expert on um, so I would I would defer uh, to Jennifer and her team but um, I don't have specific dates for the completion of the full suite of work all I have to, to really provide right now is the June 18th date that we've okay is that because you're not in the loop or is that just what you've been told that um, you can only go that way? I, I could probably find out I just I just don't know today I'm sorry hmm. Okay. So staff is comfortable with the return to uh, knowing what the projected return to service date is for the signal horn, which is June 18th. The um, repair of the South Cuba pipe is still a little bit fluffy based on yes. us this yeah. trying to source different materials or use a different material. Same with the options for any temporary repair. So we are not comfortable with, I couldn't tell you I have a comfort level with that date yet. Um, the low-level outlet work, I believe that was out till it's way out, it was almost 2025. Um, so there's also an issue with the local outlet mm -hmm. at the Spalding Dam. And then the Spalding 2 powerhouse repairs um, were also, they're trying to accelerate it so it coincides with the repair of the South Cuba pipe. It's a complex schedule because there's mm -hmm. several moving pieces, as you can right. understand. That's why I think, you know, I'll just reiterate, either it, maybe we can work together to develop something you would be comfortable with releasing to the public. Yeah, I think it's very clear to me that um, there's interest in having a better vision of the, the timeline for the full suite of work. And I can, I can, I can certainly tell these questions. We, we get all these we questions. We don't have the answers. <laughs> and I know that you know this, and it probably doesn't seem uh, necessary to restate it, but because of this situation that we and you find yourselves in, you know, our very economic viability, the health and safety of our community, the, our agriculture, our food that is being grown, all of those things are at terrible risk. And so we deserve, our community deserves, the public deserves, our agricultural community deserves to be brought in and see exactly what your schedule is so we know what to expect. Our farmers are trying to plant. When do they get water? Oh, well, maybe June 18th. I don't know, but PGME is you know, is putting the, pushing those data. That's really unacceptable. I, I hope you get that. It's unacceptable. Brandon gets it. I know, but he needs to carry I, this message to I, whomever it is that will allow us to participate. And what is the explanation for not allowing NID staff to not come on site and do our own inspections? We have we were allowed to do a second one yesterday. Oh, yesterday. Yeah. Okay. And was that sufficient from our perspective, or do we need more? I think it's one of the challenges is that it's difficult with the amount of work going on and the tightness of the powerhouse itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to get more people in there, um, there are some very significant space constraints. 
Um, we had a little bit of a download yesterday based off of the inspection, so I'll have to continue that conversation with staff and then we'll report back if there's additional inspection needed. Okay. I think another value of having a schedule would be that, you know, this is a, obviously a very complex undertaking and many moving parts in, in different aspects of this repair, all the repairs. Having a schedule would help us to understand when something slips, where is it slipping? Mm -hmm. Right now it's like it, it, it's just out there and we just can't, um, I, I don't feel like we're in a position to do our due diligence as a board when we don't have some really basic information and a schedule even at a high level would help to bridge that gap. That's right. A schedule would instill competence. Understood. I, I can't promise a different result, but I will commit to asking the question. Thank you. I, I, would, I don't that. understand why there is resistance to providing us a, a detailed schedule. Can you explain why? Um, I, I, I really can't. I think it's all governed by the, um, the agreement that's in place between NID and PG&E. Um, I also think that some of it's still being finalized. Uh, you know, we've got the June 18th date. I think some of the other items, as Jennifer said, are still um, sort of uh, to be determined. We have a general time frame or range, but uh, to put a physical date on something uh, presents a risk if uh, something unexpected were to happen. So, um, like I said, I can't promise that I'd be able to provide you all with a detailed schedule, but I will certainly commit to asking the question. I, I thought we've asked that. It's been asked and answered, and the answer was no. Well, we've provided it to staff under the conditions of the agreement. Do you have the sufficient schedule? I thought you did not. Yeah, I referenced just a little bit earlier that we did receive a schedule on Monday. There is a, essentially a four-part schedule for the four different repairs. Understood, yeah. And two of one, the low level outlet is 2025. The repair to the temporary pipe is squishy unknown. Mm -hmm. The repair to the spalding to powerhouse wicket gates is a little bit better, but it is aligning with trying to, they're trying to align that with the pipe repair because they're both needed. Um, and then the June 18th, so that is well detailed mm -hmm. out. That schedule has been given under to NID under a confidentiality clause. <laughs> That's fine. According to the operating agreement. So I can't release that without incurring some legal risk. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, we've asked Brandon and he's committed to asking his folks if it would be possible um, to maybe compromise and come up with something we can share with the public. Yeah, I think it's okay. sharing something with the public is really, really important. Um, and I would ask you again to make certain that you ask to get that for our customers in our community. Because the, 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 as Juan Brown said, the narrative out there is that PG&E, with your $2.2 .2 billion in profits, put your profits ahead of people consistently in your fires, in your work, in your maintenance, and you know, in your infrastructure uh, schedule of repairs, that that is a constant um, decision that PG&E makes. And this time, fire is terrible, but water? We cannot live without our water. We cannot grow food without our water. We cannot put out the fires that you guys cause without our water. So this is huge. And our people deserve to know what the hell is going on. And I'm done. Thank you. I have, I have a question. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to remind President Johansson that we have yes. a concern citizens. So Go ahead. patiently mine, wait. Mine will hold because okay. it's, 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 I've been waiting. I'm done. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for your all patience. Right. Uh, concerned citizen, thank you for your patience. And you're on. Thank you for this uh, most important meeting. Uh, I have a series of questions. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that if PG&E does fail to maintain its infrastructure and this negligence leads to catastrophic failure, which it has, we know the consequences can be severe, affecting legal, regulatory, financial, and economic aspects, and even be life-threatening. So I have a series of questions. Has additional NID staff been able to access damage of the damage, uh, access of the pipe, the damaged pipe? Uh, you mentioned the need for the, the long lead time for pipe. Have you considered manufacturing still piping locally or regionally? We're looking at multiple options for <clears throat> alternative material. Um, and I think we'll have more to report on that at the next meeting. Has any additional NID staff been able to actually access and see the damaged pipe? And document. Well, I want to clarify, we have staff 
it's very difficult to get out to the actual site of the pipe failure. Yeah, we have viewed the right. pipe failure from a helicopter as well as we have um, been able to view it. You can essentially view it from the road area, but we have not inspected the pipe site. We have, we were able to get additional staff into the powerhouse yesterday. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, for NID, I've been asking dozens of residents and not farmers over the last two weeks if they know what's going on with the water situation. And to be very clear, most people don't have a clue of how dire this can become. So does NID have plans for an immediate and large scale public outreach campaign for voluntary water reduction? Perhaps we could have a competition, different categories, promote it through local news stations, radio, media, and so on. Whoever reduces the most water in a certain time gets a year's worth of free water. Um, is NID is, uh, planning on doing any kind of workshops on how to utilize permaculture, gray water systems, and so on to reduce water demands? And sooner the better, right? Once these reservoirs go down, there's no going back. All great ideas. We do have a public outreach campaign. We've been on a variety of news channels. We've been on radio. We've been on, um, and we also did a direct mailing to every single raw water customer. But I do like all those ideas, so mm -hmm. we'll go back and talk about them. Um, you know, we're up, we're stepping up our presence on social media as well as we do have a news portion of our website dedicated to this issue. But I really like those ideas, so we'll continue mm -hmm. to discuss and I'll. Look into Thank you. One, one last su suggestion, actually. When COVID struck, there were the digital billboards everywhere. Uh, stay home, stay safe, and so on. Perhaps we can use the same type of digital boards in the major major thoroughfares because um, a lot of people don't go to the website. They don't check the union. They don't listen to the radio. So these digital billboards were very effective in getting the word out. So perhaps the county or o OES can actually use these again. Just another suggestion. Okay, so for another question, once the Rollins and Scott Flat, Flat Lake water levels get lower and you're utilizing low level outlets, does NID plan on testing downstream regularly for the heavy metals that are in the sediment? Is there any plans for that? Is there a need? I don't believe there's a need at this point. Based on our, our projections, we shouldn't be getting into the sediment layer that is specifically in Rollins. It's not so much an issue in Scott Flat. But we have had these conversations also with Circle as well as Nevada County, so we'll continue to keep an eye on it and then deploy any testing that would be necessary. We've also been in consultation with some of the regulatory agencies, so everybody knows what's going on. Um, it could be needed once the lake gets drawn down more. It just depends on what that level is. Okay, great. Thank you. I'd like to comment just a little bit. If Kim, Kim could you come up and uh, explain to Rollins, I believe that Rollins, the we're not using a low-level outlet to let water out. We use the power. Yeah. Well, and that, that must leave, I don't know what the difference is. So, so that's the misnomer that we're using the low-level outlet to let water out. Well, right. so we would right. also leave about 5,000 acre feet yeah, in Rollins right. to meet our in-stream flow requirements. Uh, so there's, that's why I'm not overly concerned about getting into the sediment. Yeah, okay. But we'll keep an eye on it. Fantastic. Um, I've spoken to Nevada City staff, but not Grass Valley. If the repairs are not uh, sufficient enough, uh, they expect by mid to late summer, there will not be enough water pressure for the fire hydrants in Nevada City. Do you guys have a contingency plan for this? I don't know. So uh, we have coordinated with <coughs> Nevada City staff. And even if deliveries were cut to Nevada City, that system is pressurized. So those fire hydrants should still stay pressurized. I haven't heard that concern at all. But if they have that concern, please have them reach out to us and we can hook them up with our um, expert treatment system operators too. We'll do. We'll do. Thank you. Thank you. So um, for NID again, so as you mentioned earlier, pg and &E has pocketed an additional $2.2 .2 billion last year, while people's um, pg and &E bills are absolutely skyrocketing at a very uh, inopportune time. Um, so my question is, we're being told this, this um, this infrastructure is pretty much a catastrophic event. Have there been any uh, regulatory penalties at all uh, through FERC, uh, FERC um, or the CPUC? Have any of these been imposed on PG&E? No. Okay. No, um, we don't hold the imposition of any required fines that would be simply between PG&E and the two regulatory agencies. So but that's my knowledge. Uh, okay, thank you. So I do, I do know that you've mentioned about getting some of the documentation 
on uh, the investigations and so on and inspections. Uh, if if NID does not get these documentations, do you plan on uh, actually reaching out to FERC or the CPUC to ex access these records through, let's say, a public records request? Uh, I, I think the public has a right to know whether that two point some of that two point two billion dollars has at least gone into the proper inspections and, and upkeep. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult. pg and is not subject to the same public record access laws that NID would be. Um, the FERC docket is open to the public. Anyone can search the FERC docket. Some of the information that is submitted, even by NID related to powerhouses, is um, prohibited from being distributed oh, to the public, public because of, it's an energy asset, so there's an inherent security risk. Um, but as far as the financial disclosure, <coughs> And I I don't have an answer to that question. I don't know how that I don't know that you could get that information okay. besides what they have publicly. Great. Great. Well, I just want to say thank you uh, to the NID board for doing a, a really good job at asking these questions and opening this up to the public and including a PG&E rep. I, I do want the PG&E, and this is not for Brandon, but those above him, <clears throat> there could be civil lawsuits if, if you know, such parties are being affected, including homeowners, businesses, and and farmers and and you know if, if there has been proven negligence and i would i would say as much that i think that at the very least we should have some kind of civil lawsuit if this type of damage uh does occur because as ricky was uh, clearly uh, demonstrating and stating this could be catastrophic and uh especially going into fire season and and businesses can close and i think uh you are seeing a lot of pg e customers absolutely dismayed and disgusted uh through the behavior and the greed of pg e and it would behoove everyone if this comes to an end and they actually um behave like a responsible agency that they should be so i just want to say, say thank you again to the nid board for your work thank you thank you any other, uh, Jody? Um, are you still online and wish to talk? Uh, I am still here. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, a, a couple things, and everybody's been hitting on it, and I, I don't want to jump on the bandwagon of PG&E's past and future uh, behaviors and okay. patterns, um, but a for me personally, I will just speak for me. I can't speak for the city of Colfax or any of the other uh, people who generate their major revenue from tourism and recreation. Uh, I have three businesses on Rollins Lake. Uh, if there's no water, I can't rent boats. If there's no beach, I can't sell food and nobody's gonna go to my store. So for us personally, uh, I'm wiped out for this season, basically. There, I have no recourse, uh, as far as I know. Uh, PG&E, uh, again, the billboards and that discussion, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. Um, I only get my information from reviewing these NID board meetings. And thank God NID has been so transparent in all of this. I wouldn't have even known about it. So my question to, to PG&E, basically, is have has there been any discussion for anything other than agriculture and that there's a lot of small businesses that rely on the water at Rollins Lake we certainly acknowledge the impact across a number of business sectors um, all I can really say is that we're doing the best we can to restore water deliveries in a timely manner and um, we're going to stay focused on that and um, work in partnership with NID to make it happen. So. But can you understand that that doesn't oh, help? Yeah. <laughs> I do understand. Okay, so where should a... a right. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jody. Yes, you. Where, where should a person like me, a small business, where should we go? Who should we ask for assistance to, to manage our way through this? This is not, it's not, I did not cause this. NID did not cause this. My little tiny eight employees did not cause this. This is our entire income for a year is from May to September and it's gone. So where is, where is some sort of assistance or guidelines or something to, to 
get us little guys uh, foot up or something. You know, I'm not aware of any mechanism, you know, through our through our company that would be able to accommodate that type of thing. I I would imagine that perhaps a small business administration might have some resources. Um, but um, again, we're just singularly focused on getting the repair work done uh, so that we can bring a normal sense of normalcy back to uh, the system locally. Okay, so then I'm only going to have one last comment. Um, Brandon, you mentioned many times that water is the most powerful source on earth. Um, is it then quite common for PG&E water uh, powerhouses to go out because of this force? Or is this a rarity? Uh, it's certainly not common. Okay. Hey, and thank you, Rachel. <laughs> Say again? <laughs> this is Trevor Calder. I have a couple suggestions for you. The the supervisors in both counties have been very active, um, so I'd suggest reaching out to your local supervisor and seeing if they have a suggestion on assistance. And then also uh, Assemblyman Patterson and um, and Congressman Kylie have both been supportive. Um, so I'd reach out to their offices as well. Maybe they have an idea of, of where to look for some assistance. I have reached out to Kylie and with no response. So. It you certainly can, uh, yeah. You can send me your contact uh, to my email, just division for at nidwater.com, and, and I'll get you in touch with Joe, or I'm sorry, with Kevin. Uh, that'd be awesome. Thank you very much. Further. <laughs> You've yeah. been so patient. You've been so patient. You Thank will. you. Well, Go ahead. There's no more Mr. public Chris, comment, I see, but uh, it's a workshop anyway. Go ahead, right. Chris. So, uh, Mr. I'm a huge fan of illustrations and maps, and the plumbing, I keep talking about the plumbing, and Jennifer mentioned the low-level outlet, and I'm confused about the uh, low-level outlet having any uh, benefit to us, because I don't understand the plumbing, because um, the water is going down the river over the spillway. I took a picture of it on Sunday. It's a mongoose uh, water. And that, wouldn't that be the same effect if low level was dumping water to the river? Uh, once you would be able to utilize the low level outlet once the reservoir came off the spill. To get it in the river? Yeah, and then you can push it from the river. I'd have to ask one of them. There, so, there is a connection on the low level outlet. Oh, I think you. Yes. I, and can't I you also that. push some from spill some out of the river lower? Not the canal fill the river. You mean drop the river? Now I'm, now I'm even more confused. Okay. Yeah, how does it get there? Yeah, this is what I like. Could we have a crude paper drop? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> white yeah, people. Well, we'll work with PG&E, maybe come up with more just of a hand-drawn schematic. Not, not that it would get us in trouble with work, but we could understand how this all because we keep hearing all these things. Okay. Or we could also like, just walk them through a Google Earth image at the next meeting. I, I want to say that something like that does exist, so I can. Seek that out. I, I would it is, okay. get, there's a lot of ways to move water in that very tight area, right, and they're right. all somewhat interconnected. So we'll do. We'll address this somehow next meeting. That'd be great. Nice. Thank you. Oops, I had one quick statement. Okay. Well, Karen, oh, go for it. Go yeah. first. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, so Ricky and I attended a circle event last week, and the questions I got were all from treated water customers. Mm -hmm. And so I think that a, a communication to treated water folks, the, and the comment being, are we gonna be able to turn on our taps and get water? They, they are under the impression that we could run out of treated right. water. So I, I think it would be helpful to just reinforce with a communication to those folks. Let us work on that. It's a lot of customers to do a direct I know. It's awfully expensive. Um, we could probably put a comment on the bill. We usually get about. Oh, that would be um, great. Oh, yeah. that is a great idea. Yeah. Great idea. Yeah, in in bold, <laughs> red, large letters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let us work on that. We'll figure out a way to communicate. That would be great. Yeah. That would be yeah. terrific. Too that the system is pressurized. No matter where the water, how little the water is getting into it. That's yeah. The the, <clears throat> the fire hydrant question in particular was mm -hmm. related to Nevada City. So let me also coordinate with those. Yeah. Yeah. Just to make sure they're aware. Perfect. Um, 
I'm wondering how we're doing on conservation to date. Huh? So irrigation season just started April mm -hmm. 15th. We don't have the most updated numbers. In fact, Chip and I were talking about this morning. Um, how are we looking kind of the first week year compared to last year, first week irrigation season? So once we, next couple of days, we should have a better handle on us. We're tracking the same or for a little bit less. Um, based off of the voluntary conservation, ship notified me this morning, we've had 218 customers call in and voluntarily reduce their allocation, which is equal to 332 miners inches or 3,000 acres. So wow. we're doing good. We greatly appreciate um, the consideration from the public and the ongoing commitment to help us through this challenging time, and we'll continue to provide updates on so, any conservation. So we need more. How does, how does that compare to everybody? Robot? We have a number there. Why not? If every raw water customer cut back 20%. Oh, so it's about 119,000 19, acre feet delivered. Yeah, and, so this is a small uh, portion. 22,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it, it shows that we need more conservation. Yes. And what, but also remember one thing right now is that most of the canals have been being filled with fill water. We don't want to waste right. fill water, so we use the fill water to. Correct wet the canals, mm -hmm. um, so we didn't have to rely on storage. So the water delivery, we purposely have not cut back at this point because we were using spill water. Because there is a lot of water wasted on just wetting up the canals. So I mentioned to Jennifer two other areas of concern for me. One is the financial impact to the district mm -hmm. and would like an analysis of this presented when it makes sense, but sooner than later. Um, financial impact to the district. To the district. To the district, yeah. yeah. That, that question's been asked me already. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely a financial impact. We've been waiting on a little, uh, some of these little issues to get sorted out so we can have better projections. But mm -hmm. probably the next board meeting, we should have something that is changing. It's projection based, but right. we will present something. And then my uh, last concern is just I, I'm really worried about next year. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we'll get through this year. But I worry that we're going to, we've been blessed with uh, good r rainfall in recent years. <laughs> the, we know the pendulum will swing yeah. and that uh, next year could be the bad year. And even if it's not, what if it's an average year? I really feel that as a board member, we need to be seeing some projections about that. And I realize we're talking about moving targets, and so we don't know exactly how we'll end up this year, but some analysis and projections of here's how it looks. If we, if we just get back online on June 18th, what, and we have an average year, a dry year, a wet year, right. what is our storage likely to be? Averages in October. Right. And we have those projections. The one thing we're waiting for right now is for this kind of natural in-stream flow mm -hmm. next couple of weeks to shake out. Then we'll have much more solid projections. And it'll also allow PG&E to get out of the demo mode and really back into construction. And then we'll all have a little bit more confidence because then you're more into routine construction. And then we will be able to bring some carryover predictions forward. Thank you. That's it for me. Uh, Trevor, Eve. Can we go to one? Sure. Is that okay? Yeah. I do have one other question, though, but, for our legal counsel, just really quickly. Okay. Okay. Good. Dustin. Yes. Given that we will be under some kind of state or regulatory mandate with regard to our, our flows, how does how do you see this overlaying or impacting? I mean, can we go to the state and go, hey, these all, all these guys cut off our water. We cannot, you know. We cannot do these minimum in-stream flows because of them. So, um, as what do we do about that? Um, there are options should the need arise to request variances or okay, exceptions. Okay, good. Um, but remember, we are not operating under the current or the under license. So, yeah. what we are operating under today, uh, in terms of our <coughs> regulatory commitments, is very manageable, and it's it's built into the projections that you have seen and will continue. To okay, do. thank you. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Juan, thank you for waiting. <laughs> Unmute. There you go. Um, just a quick update on the size and scope on the pipe failure, the steel pipe failure on the Yuba Canal. I was able to get up overhead last week in the airplane and take a look at it, and I did find it and got a good view of it. Uh, 
as Chip Close says, the pipe itself is, a, I believe, a 56 inch diameter pipe. And the rock slide, it appears to me to have taken out at least 200 feet of length of the pipe. So the upstream end of that pipe sheared off clean at a connection and the rock slide pushed that pipe down towards down much lower in the canyon. Um, and the downstream part of the pipe kind of bends back up and uh, I believe is still connected to the rest of the pipe, but it's, it's a large section of pipe, uh, least at least 200 feet long, that uh, got knocked down by the rocks. And uh, pg e was on the scene with the helicopters, and they are they were working the issue uh, as as far ago as last week. And how are they anchored? The pipe. Don't know. How's are that they I'm just looking at it from the air, from a safe distance, so I can only look at the very big picture. But there may be very well be uh, damage to the uh, anchoring of the pipe, uh, both upstream and downstream from the actual damaged area because it jerked it so hard with that rock slide. Brandon, we could get an update on that. <clears throat> yeah, my understanding is it's um, supported in a number of ways, um, steel struts and cribbing, and then some dry masonry. Right that this way. Um, but I, I can ask what specifically was um, holding it in place in the slide area and follow up. I believe, I believe it was steel cribbing or scaffolding of some, some type. Juan, I'm following your videos and they're really excellent. Thank they you are. for doing they're those. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Ann. I'll get that update. I got uh, Kellen here <laughs> updating. I'll put it on Facebook real quick, just the raw video that I shot from the damaged area and you can take a look at it. And your web and how do people access that? Well, uh, oh, yes, I'm this will be on Facebook, but then I'll do uh, a full update on, on um, the Blanco Lirio YouTube channel. Probably Friday, I want to do an update on this whole situation here, and I'll post those pictures that I was able to take. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Trevor. Yeah, so first, thanks for coming, Brandon. Of course, appreciate it. Happy to be here. Uh, we're, we're neighbors down in South Placer, so I appreciate you being an active community member down there. And I'm sure uh, some of this is, is You've heard this from many of the agricultural folks um, in the area, but just want to sh uh, share why the schedule is important for that community. So three years ago in Placer County, ag was about 90 million, then it moved to 100 million, and this past year was 110 million. So this is a, a growing industry <coughs> during an economy that's very challenging, <coughs> and water is that. We are we have customers currently making seed decisions for next year and deciding how much rice they can plant this year. So as much detail as we can provide them on where the decision points are in a schedule, you know, you can get out to a point and say, okay, at this point I have to decide if that field's getting planted or, or if we need to put something else there this year, that sort of thing. So um, that, that would be one of the reasons why um, I, w I would like to see, uh, at least at a community level, something shared uh, with the ag community. Um, there, there's a cascading effect here, too, outside of our, our service area. So even South Sutter, um, so Camp Far West, they rely on some extra water we put into the Bear River there, and all of that's been curtailed. You know, you can buy some extra water. That's been stopped for the year, so that'll affect the rice grain uh, as well. Now this, the last comment actually for everybody, uh, including ourselves, is uh, you know, we build, in my day job, we build things at high scale. And I'm really concerned hearing that this is like an aberration. But when you really look at the failure uh, scenario here, this is a very high scale system, very big you know, water system with a lot of moving parts. Whenever you build something that big, your, the things that you think are only going to happen every once in a while start happening very often. And there's at least four failures in the system that have choked off our water supply. And it's, I, I don't understand why we're not talking about how NID makes sure there is a bypass going forward. I mean, that should be part of the long-term fix. So I, w I would encourage everyone to go read a book or an article actually called Tail at Scale, 
It's whenever you build something big, those little things that sit in the corners, they start popping up. And uh, the longer you use it, the more you're going to see them. And we should never be put in a situation where Spalding 1, Spalding 2, the low-level uh, release, the, the cell view, and all failing at the same time. This will happen again somewhere else in the system. And we need to make sure that we control our own destiny. And uh, I think that you know, none of these, there's no easy answers to that, but I implore us as a board and, and management to look at you know, having simple bypass, even getting you know, 50, 70 CFS you know, around that building should be something that should be done. I mean, you should never engineer something that there's only one way through it. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, I challenge all of us to, to look at that going forward. Again, thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Good points, Trevor. Any more comments from the public? No. Barbara, are you halfway up? <laughs> you probably have a little more ready, but it's my mind. Um, do you have a date if construction is delayed and it's not going to be issue making? What would be the drop dead date to have to go to mandatory? Mm -hmm. We're Good getting question. close. We're continuing to update our projections. Like I said, the next couple of weeks is where we have a better handle on the amount of natural energy flow in the reservoirs. What I will be arguing right now is we are getting all of the preparation work done in the event that we do have to recommend going mandatory, um, but that consists of having all materials for reorganizing. So something like that wouldn't occur till in sometime in. Probably in July, it just depends on how we shake out. So if it was delayed to July, you possibly could be mandatory. It's a potential, but we are constantly updating numbers, and we do think the next couple of weeks will cause the bigger swings in the numbers, so we'll have a better projection after that. So with uh, the second fall you know, being delayed until the fall, how will that affect filling up all of these ways? It'll be slower. Refill will be slower. Um, having only one horn and then having to go back out on outage to prepare the second horn. So it's definitely a concern. Um, I think Director Hull asked the same question. We will, once we get some of these numbers to settle down, we'll also bring back a presentation related to carryover and refill projection. Definitely. We've already started looking at next year. We are getting a handle on it. Our hesitancy comes in is that we know our numbers aren't overly solid right now um, due to the natural weather patterns and how what's happening. So we, we'll once that comes down the next couple weeks, we'll bring it back. Thank you. So I have just one more question, and I think you touched on this before, but um, uh, can you declare a, a state of emergency to help our small businesses that are going to be affected? And we have already had some conversations with the county. Um, the county has started kind of taking a look at some, a variety of different relief programs, very similar to what they did during the pandemic. Um, at this point, based on our communications with the um, OES folks at both counties, we don't feel that a declaration of emergency is likely necessary until such time there are mandatory restrictions. And is there information for those businesses rather than saying, you know, call the county? Is that something we can put together so we can get that information to folks? Yeah, I'm just not overly familiar with those services, but let me do some coordination with the county, and then if uh, we can, I'll put something on the website. Thank you. I think the, think the suggestion would be that those businesses that are financially impacted should keep records. Start documenting now. Yeah, there are some, some of the agricultural folks we do now are starting to um, make early insurance claims, as Dr. Calder mm -hmm. referenced, down in South Sutter. They usually receive um, two acre feet of water per acre of land, and the allocation this year has been reduced to 1.1 acre feet. So there are several folks that are applying for insurance already. Um, so, you know, insurance is always um, an option, but that is dependent upon your specific policy, which mm -hmm. we cannot speak to. But I will coordinate with the county. But record keeping is always good. So, 
quick question on state of emergency. Is mandatory is triggers it or because a lot of people would be hurting financially even if we don't right. go to a mandatory and how yeah, how do we help mm -hmm. them? Yes, mm -hmm. that's my point. Well, I think that there's a it's a smaller subset of folks um, as the speaker earlier referenced, those that are relying on some of the recreation facilities and their businesses are based around them, certainly they will likely experience financial impacts. I'll have to um, communicate with the county related to their specific programs. In ID ourselves, we don't have a program that we're able to um, offset any damages that those folks experience. Correct. Yeah, we're, we're not. We have no ability to do that. Yeah. But we do have 300,000 people coming to use our facilities a year, so we're going to be taking a significant financial hit. We are going to be taking a revenue reduction in recreation hydropower, and then we have additional um, issues on the expense side for water, as well as associated reduction revenue with the voluntary contribution. But right. Yeah. They'll be hearing. Okay. You'll be hearing from us at, at some point when we. We add up the debits and the credits. Yeah, just mention um, on the ag side, as far as having yeah. something declared, Josh talked to that last week when he was there from Platts County Ag Commission, is that they're they're taking a wait and see approach. My guess is that they'll have to do something at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michael, you wanted to? Yeah. Just a couple questions. Um, I, I, I thought I heard some time ago that Fuller Lake is being drawn down for some reason. Is there repairs being done in Fuller Lake that are? Fordyce. Fordyce? It's Fordyce, yeah. Fordyce. Fordyce. Okay, Fordyce. Fordyce. <laughs> so how's that affecting, that, that drawdown affecting, <laughs> doesn't that go into Spalding? If we, it's not going to affect any of our carryover this year. Chip would have to speak to it more clearly though. Yeah, so uh, I believe Eden is doing a project on they are dropping it down. That water is flowing into Spalding and basically filling. Those are necessities to build out Lake too. Yes, but all part of the plan. It was part of the long-term work project. As part of this repair. No, no, this was a separate project that was already finished. It's okay. a separate repair. Right. And then another question I have: Does NID have legal access? To the Spalding Dam and to the pump house. In other words, in other words, what's keeping NID from having a um, project manager on site daily to kind of track what's going on and, and to report back to you guys daily? Yeah, we have no legal authority through the coordinated operating agreement to have any access to their facilities. As I stated, PG&E has granted access um, on two different times, two different days now. Um, you know, that would entirely be up to the to pg and &E. There's no legal authority baked into our agreement to provide for that. As part of negotiations for moving forward, could you negotiate having a superintendent on site to <laughs> to be able to track the 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 confidential um, time schedule that they're giving you, so that they're, so you guys somehow know that. The one that they're giving you confidentially has someone on site that's actually, oh, we got this done this week, and we got this done this week, and that there's some sort of an accountability for tracking the confidential um, project repairs. It would have to be something that would be negotiated in, under a new term, new agreement, which I always forget how many years we have left is a lot. Right. New 2016. So. Through the end of the new license, which we haven't received, the new license will be 30 to 50 years. So, in 30 to 50 years, we'll make that request of Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> Hope I'll be retired by then. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I think the elephant in the room is there are definitely losses, financial losses, whether it's to NID or to recreation around both of the Scotts Flat Lake and so sh shouldn't there be discussion now to understand how those losses are going to be um, compensated to the recreational um, people around Scotthot, I mean, uh, yeah, Scotthot Lake and Rollins Lake? In other words, I think that people in the public, the public should have some understanding that there is some 
motion for getting compensation for their losses from this this step back with not having water. I don't know that there is a specific program by which they could apply to to receive relief on those losses. That wouldn't be done through NID folks and insurance. The county might set up a program and, and then, you know, there's always legal considerations that would have to be considered. I think more than that, that question is actually more to, to PG. It seems to me that pg e should be already actively involved in trying to figure out how to cover the losses so that there aren't lawsuits and people having to go through that process. Is there a way to start the possibility of understanding how these compensations will come back to either NID or to the general public? I can't really speak to it. I know there's a, a variety of different relief funds. I don't know the ins and outs of it. Maybe that's something we can speak with Brandon Does offline. Do you have insurance to cover that? We don't. <laughs> well, but, you know what? Maybe a question that Dustin could answer is, like, for the people who made those, had those horrible losses in Paradise, right. there were legal actions. And some got compensated something. And how long did that take, though? It's actually still progressing. So, um, yeah, there was, following the 2018 campfire, there was a number of lawsuits. I mean, um, dozens of lawsuits filed, ranging from inverse condemnation to negligence and a host of other claims that uh, the bankruptcy in early 2019 funneled all of those claims into the bankruptcy process. PG&E's bankruptcy. So PG&E's okay. bankruptcy. Yes. And uh, as part of the plan of reorganization, a trust was, uh, there was three parts basically, a public agency settlement, a subrogation um, settlement, and then everybody else, which they call the fire victim trust, which is a capped trust. Um, Fire victims that are in that fire victim trust are still, to this day, some of them don't have their uh, claims adjudicated yet. So it's still it's in six years in process of winding down. But um, yeah, it, the, when you get into a legal setting like that, it is not an expedited resolution. Um, so yeah, I'm not a, an opponent of lawsuits, and I'm just thinking that, that we can see it coming. It, they don't do it. Is the answer? They don't do it. it. Seems like we should be pushing PG now to somehow voluntarily start dealing with some of the, some of the losses to avoid lawsuits down the road. That's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. I think the goal is to fix this as fast as we can. Mm -hmm. Right. Get it moving and minimize the impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Jody, you're back on. Uh, unmute, please. There we go. There we go. Thank you. Um, I just had a uh, just a real quick comment and question, and then I'll get out of your hair. I promise. Um, a, thank you, all of you, for your again. Your transparency is amazing, Jennifer. You're awesome, Ricky. I could listen to you all day. Um, but my last <laughs> <Come on. laughs> oh, you're real quick question, <laughs> and Trevor, and I love Trevor too. Thank you for the info. Um, Okay. Real quick, if, uh, and I guess this is going to Jennifer, if if at some point there is a state of emergency declared, as of today in the near future, we don't know if next year is also going to be a problem. Do you know off the top of your head if that state of emergency would roll over into next year, or is that something that's just going to be like a, hey, we'll wait for the snow to fall next year and see what happens? Yeah, they're typically left open until they are closed and there are all opportunities for reimbursement mm -hmm. through FEMA or through OES are exhausted. Um, typically, you have to have those open in order to apply. So it, you do see often that agencies will leave them open for some time. So there's no, well, you would have to drop, you, you wouldn't have to close it this season or reopen it. You would just leave it open. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I do, Jody. I do want to step in here because this. I want to make sure everybody's clear. NID has declared emergency, right? And uh, but you know our declaration of emergency does not trigger the Stafford Act or California's equivalent to the Stafford Act. So that's where we need really state assistance. Mm -hmm. County counties can't even dictate that, is my understanding. But 
certainly county declarations assist and open up other programs. But, um, you know, the deg- a Stafford Act emergency, that's like a major federal disaster. Um, you know, we could eventually get to that point. Hopefully we don't. But that is, I just wanted to be clear that NID, we've done what we could do. We, we have declared a local emergency here in our service area. But it doesn't have those cascading um, programs that it opens up like some of the other agencies' declarations would. That's valid. But yeah, the county, know. Thank you. based on our state of emergency, the county could declare. The county has their own ability to declare an emergency. That opens up a suite of programs. The state, Cal OES, has uh, the ability to declare a state emergency. And then the Stafford Act is the federal equivalent of that. So there, there are levels of emergency declaration that each open up their own suite of programs to, you know, a pub- public assistance. So I, I was under, my understanding was the county is waiting for us to declare a state of emergency. I thought we had, no, and in effect. We have, we, we have an emergency declaration. And so we need to impress upon the county that there it is, there, uh, the, the next step is theirs. Correct. I think when we were speaking in general terms when we were talking, but just as Dustin just stated, Yes, the next step in the emergency declaration would be the county and or the state. When you start applying for reimbursement through those programs as they escalate, you're always required to have your own resolution mm-hmm. declaration. And then which we've already done. Agent, done. Yeah. Which we've already done. So we know this afternoon we need to get on the phone. Well, no, I think we were waiting to see if it was mandatory conservation. I right. think we were waiting for the we, next. We yeah. are, but the impacts are already happening. Well, I, yeah, let us do a little bit more coordination with the county and all. Counties. 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 Both counties. Thank you. Four questions. Um, seeing no more public input, uh, directors, any more questions? Your ex. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So you carry the, you carry the narrative. Carry the narrative. Okay, yeah. well, um, happy to do that. A lot of great questions. My my question is, who's going to compile these questions for Brandon to get the answers? Well, he's going to watch the video, he said. Well, no, I mean, oh, yeah. We want it written out. It'll be in the minutes, and also Brandon had committed to watching watch it. it. Okay, but I, I think we'll have, we'll present the list of questions to be answered. It'll be in the minutes, and then I'll come. Um, and the next question is, how often are we going to do this? This is this is so dang important. You said to every, be here every meeting. Every meeting. Yeah, I think, and we have enough topics to discuss at the next meeting. Um, and if Brandon is the meeting that will plan on having it every meeting, and if there's no change, we can report out on that and ask. Okay. And there's so, also Zoom options, so if it's a low key change meeting. Sounds good. <laughs> Okay. A couple of weeks. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for taking the heat. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I reminded you. Of, um, thank you. And uh, like I said, I'll always yeah, show yeah. up. So I mean, the position you're in, and uh, appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> General Manager's report. I don't have a whole lot to update. It's been pretty quiet boring around here. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I have to update on is uh, Dustin Chip and I, as well as Tor, have been working diligently on our voluntary agreement proposal related to to the basement plan. Standards. There is a voluntary agreement workshop that the state board is putting on. It begins today. It's running. Say tomorrow Thursday, so Dustin and I will be meeting. Um, we are. I am going to be on a panel on Friday. Timing is unknown, uh, so if you'd like to tune in, you can do that remotely. I'd like tuning in. Too. Oh, and then I, I did have something um, to report on. We had, as the board is aware, we started one of the board strategic plans is employee engagement, and we have been really focusing on one of our strategic of session planning, and we had a really great event. Um, two, two. two weeks ago, two weeks ago, um, for <coughs> the leadership implementation team. So these are current leaders, also <coughs> those that have been identified as potential future leaders in the organization. And we had a um, speaker come in and do an emotional intelligence seminar for us, and it was absolutely outstanding. 
part of our job is communication with people, whether it's customers, each other, um, that information, coordination. So we find a lot of value in being able to communicate effectively, and we've gotten great feedback. I think staff um, learned a lot of tools and also gained some open uh, Yes, we are aiming for um, you know, better communication, but also more efficiencies. And I think that we so very cool. Wanted to share that with the board. It was just fun, but also very insightful. And I don't know if I've ever seen staff so tired. Maybe like a little <laughs> mind bent thing. Maybe they were pretty exhausted Good. afterwards. So we would greatly appreciate it. Yeah, it was a stretch. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes when you have staff people don't maybe don't place as much importance into those types of things. But that is one of the number. Director's report, Chris. Uh, no report. Yes, I went to the State of the UBAS um, event that was extraordinarily well attended, and um, Karen was there as well. And um, I was grateful to Aaron Seitlerman, who was able to take and uh, our, this PG&E debacle issue and was able to present it to the people there in a way that but he just did a really good job. And then afterwards, Karen and I were there, and we took a lot of questions from folks after the event. So it was worthwhile to be there and, um, and represent NID. But we did. Uh, on Saturday, my husband and I are hosting the AAW Nevada branch a fundraiser. We hope to raise $30,000 on Saturday, so if anybody's got some spare change in their pocket, I can use it to help boost the fundraising. And the, the revenue that we raise will go to support scholarships for girls uh, and uh, seeking to pursue STEM education as well as return to college. And then on Tuesday, I'm going to attend the Placer County Farm Bureau or Farm Tour. Uh, I will not be on the Farm Tour. I'm glad oh. you're going. I will be at the Kentucky Derby. Oh, cool. oh cool. fun. Do you have a hat? Yeah, we want to see the hat. I have a pink suit. That's cool. oh. Oh. All right. I think uh, oh, I, I know, right. We can have a slide presentation. This pink. It's pink. <laughs> it's uh, other than that. Uh, is that in Lexington or Louisville? <laughs> it is. In, it's just outside of Louisville. Yeah, cool. okay. That's so, good. Yeah, be good. Have yeah. it been. Yeah. Bucket list item. That's definitely bucket list. Um, I did not go to this. River, mm -hmm. But I wanted to, <laughs> but and even though I wasn't infectious or contagious. Um, Can I say something about the, the state of the? Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, save the U. But one of the things that was really interesting is the presentation they talked about. Metal uh, restoration, which was very impressive. Uh, Established a really positive relationship with the Forest Service, so that was I thought an interesting. We've done a lot of great work and a good partnership to have in the. Um, so I went to Penn Valley Mac on Thursday night. A lot of interest in this. Impacts we don't even comprehend yet, I guess. So anyway, a um, couple of things. Barbara interviewed me for the Greater Grass Valley Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Um, you're looking for more interviews? Please. Okay. So um, that really gets to work. How many people see that?
many, many, many thousands out there. I want to thank Pasquale and Ubinet for the coverage that you are providing the uh, investigative reporting. Well done. They did our helicopter sign. Yeah. Yes, she did. <laughs> <laughs> I, am, I, am, I am very disappointed I didn't get it right. <laughs> As are we during yeah. the. Uh, I know, us we too. We all want to. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I was up at the airport one day and they came back in with this grin on everybody's face. And I'm going, wait a minute, who are you guys? NID? <laughs> How do I get a ride? Yeah. It's hard to get off the helicopter without a big smile. Oh my God. Anyway, um, met the father of Kyle Hampton yesterday, had a great talk. And through the dad's through the dad's eye, Kyle, Kyle Hampton is an incredible young man working for NID. No, I like oh. It. Who's looking to make it life, you know. It, it, I, I just it was just a great uh, connection in Chico. Oh, awesome. And this is what happens when you wear an ID hat. You never know who you run into. Sure. Yeah, and have these great conversations. But I uh, got an insight of through Kyle, through his dad's view of what Kyle was doing, and it was all positive. It was incredible. Very cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's more. Uh, just on the farm, we're not having daily conversations, but we have changed our planting uh, process this year. It's kind of like, yeah, we could we may end up with not a lot of water, enough water, but we're still going to go for it. it. It's almost a not doubling down on our planting Farmer spirit. Yeah, it, it's that there's an opportunity here to increase our market share, to help others increase our food supply. So we're going for it. And the crops are shorter duration. So if we do lose some crops, it's not going to be because we lost them and couldn't irrigate the last month. It'll be because we just didn't plant the next rotation. So it won't be a physical loss but it'll be an opportunity loss. So anyway, um, that's what's going on in the farm. Thank you for all for being here. See you at the next meeting. Thank you.